Hola, hola. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? Happy Easter to everybody. What an amazing day. Hey, Dr. Vong here. I have a special amazing guest today. His name is Aaron Hegman. He um, is Mr. Walmart Grocery Delivery. So he won that business and uh, his company is hiring drivers and he's telling people all about it. So uh, this is going to be an interesting conversation because uh, along with the coronavirus, it's going to do a lot of damage to our economy. A lot of people are furloughed from their jobs. And sadly enough, they're going to find out that they might not have a job when they return. So we're going to have this really good conversation with Aaron here in a second. And uh, let me double check, make sure I'm looking good and sounding good. And then I'll bring Mr. Aaron Hegman on. And uh, I'm also trying to stream this live onto YouTube. So hello to my YouTube watchers, if you guys are watching. Uh, this is awesome. We have 500 people watching. Cool. Excellent. How very cool. All right. Sounds good there. Happy Easter, everybody. You guys are amazing. Please do me a favor and share the broadcast wherever you're watching it from. If you're watching it from my Facebook fan page, Good morning to you. I hope you're doing amazing as well as new on my YouTube channel. I'm doing live. Hopefully this is <laughs> being broadcasted live on my YouTube channel. And um, yeah, we can get started here. It's going to be amazing. Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Duck Vaughn, world famous bariatric surgeon, author of 13 books. Y'all know that. And uh, we've been talking coronavirus now. It seems like we're making it like a really big difference in uh, in the impact that coronavirus is having. So a couple of weeks ago, I made a video showing the project projections. If they were to keep up the way they're going, we'd have a million to a million and a half cases of coronavirus and 20,000 deaths uh, by Easter. Well, today's Easter. I'm happy to report I was wrong because the um, because you guys took social distancing seriously and the models have corrected it. Now, um, I am sad to say I was correct on the 20,000 deaths in the United States alone. We are, um, we'll hit 21,000 deaths today. We're about 550,000 cases on Easter and um, 1.8 million or so worldwide, over 100,000 deaths, uh, and we have yet to peak. So this is gonna continue for a while and, um, you know, uh, but but we're making a difference and it's my hopes that you guys will really continue to take this social distancing and staying at home and quarantining very seriously because what we're doing is working. What we're seeing today is a result of what we've been doing for the last two weeks. And remember, there's always this lag period. You're always behind the virus. So, so in that regards, what we're going to see is uh, a leveling off of the cases, which is awesome. And then, um, but there will be a lag time of the deaths. The deaths will keep going up. Now they recently lowered their projection on deaths in the United States to about 60,000, which means if you um, are about a 4% death rate, you're still gonna have two and a half million coronavirus cases before this is all over. Now for the skeptics and the people who said, see, we're overreacting, imagine what the numbers would be like if we had not done social distancing. Imagine what it would be like if we hadn't shut down America. We're having 60,000 deaths with shutdown of America. Another way to think about it, imagine where we would be today if they had waited one week later to shut down the NBA basketball season. If they had waited one week later to shut down the Houston Livestock Rodeo. Um, they shut down South by Southwest before even a single day, which was incredible. So imagine what our world would be like if that if they hadn't shut, shut everything down. But because they did, we have been able to um, blunt the um, blunt the uh, the effects of this coronavirus in the United States, even though and we are blowing the numbers compared to other countries. Um, and, uh, but it would have been a lot, lot worse. All right. And this is not a political statement where it's not to be about politics, but it is what it is. Right. Um, but imagine how bad the numbers would be if we had waited one more week to take action. So, uh, because we've shut down the economy, what we need to do is, um, kind of prepare you guys for what's going to happen once we go back to some form of normalcy. So for me and my channel, for my following, I want to continue doing the coronavirus updates like I just did, but 
we also want to educate and entertain you guys at the same time. So we're gonna, I'm gonna bring on some special guests and um, to kind of talk about what's happening. I've got uh, in the future lineup today, I have an amazing guest today, but my future lineup includes celebrity guests such as Potsy from Happy Days. It's gonna be amazing. Uh, and you guys remember Ralph Mouth, <laughs> Don Most. Um, we will also be talking to him hopefully too. I've got an actress friend from Mad TV will be on. I've got uh, a Mickey Mouseketeer, Dale Galbado is gonna be on. Frank Shankwitz, the founder of Make-A-Wish Foundation will be on. Um, I'm trying to coordinate schedules with Brian Smith, the founder of Ugg Boots. I just got confirmed last night, you guys are the first to hear it, I will have celebrity chef Todd English on to talk about what's happening in the restaurant business uh, due to coronavirus and all of the restaurant workers and things like that and, and how life will be afterwards. Uh, coming up next week, I have the world's smartest man, uh, Walter O'Brien, who the TV show Scorpion is based on, if you've ever seen Scorpion. So he's going to talk about, is this really a government conspiracy? What the government's really doing? What big businesses are doing? It's going to be amazing. So stay tuned for my channel. For um, Just want to update you guys. As always, I love the fact that uh, you guys are watching and sub sub subscribing and for all your support. So thank you for sharing. And with that, I'd like to bring on my first guest ever in this new transition period. Uh, my honor and privilege to introduce my really good friend, Mr. Aaron Hegman, who's the CEO and owner of uh, Delivery Drivers Incorporated, DDI Inc. Um, and uh, he has uh, the, the extreme distinction of being the Walmart grocery delivery man. Uh, he handles all of the back office and HR for the drivers. And he's here today to tell us what's happening in the gig economy and what we can look forward to. And with that, let's bring on Mr. Aaron Hagman. Happy Easter, brother. Happy Easter, my friend. Happy Easter, everybody online. Good to see you all. Happy Sunday. How are you, my friend? It's good to see you. I'm excellent, man. Great to see you. Tell people where you're calling from. Uh, so I am in uh, Laguna Beach in Orange County in Southern California. Yeah. And uh, actually, I want to say it's been crazy in, well, for us, that it's been rainy for like 10 yeah. days. So it is wet and gray, and uh, I'll take it because it's usually gorgeous. So, anyways, in California. in California, you guys were one of the early, early states to lock down, and you locked, you guys locked down a couple of days before New York State, and look what happened in New York State. And you guys have managed to keep your numbers low. Are you going stir crazy? What's it like in California? You know, um, I'm happy to say that we haven't seen any of the stuff that you and I have discussed, which was the hospital infrastructure getting statistically overwhelmed mm -hmm. yet. You know, fingers crossed, prayers and all that, that, you know, it continues to be this way. But I was looking at stats because, you know me, I'm a numbers dork. Mm -hmm. And uh, California has some of the lowest frontline infection rate uh, per capita in the whole country. And I've been reading some interesting articles about possibly uh, us having some early infection and, and like December, or January time. Uh, yeah, actually I, was, I think back, uh, you know, we had very er an early flu season, some really high spikes. Uh, I had employees out. I have about 40 employees in my office in California. And yeah. uh, there was a time where there was 20, 30% of the people missing at any time for, if I think back, but yeah. anyway, who knows? So, so it's been all right in California. It's, you know, everybody's staying home. Yeah. And you can briefly describe, we've got over 1,300 people watching, so you're a hit, brother. And, you're, and your Marvel t-shirt is a hit. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's yeah. like a holiday. I was trying to keep it real. I don't know. So <laughs> America. Can you briefly describe your company, DDI. What is it? What do you always do? Short and sweet. We do all of the boring work behind the scenes for driver companies. Uh, what does that mean? That means we're recruiting drivers all around the country. Uh, we're onboarding drivers, you know, running paperwork and background mm -hmm. checks, making sure everybody gets paid, running some cool technology, insurance programs, benefits, and even unemployment support these days mm -hmm. for uh, drivers. And I think important to our conversation today, we almost exclusively specialize in the 1099 world, which right. of course, Lyman Drivers has applications everywhere. So when we first met, your company was already pretty big. You had 3,000 drivers at the time. And how many drivers do you guys handle now? Um, the numbers are probably closer to 10 to 12,000 active um, wow. cycling through. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that must be, that's really robust growth. How have you handled that during this co Corona time? 
you know, I'm I'm really proud <laughs> to say that's the, the message I'll give to this audience. You know, good news, right? You know, we've uh, added a few jobs on my team internally. Uh, many of our clients now we work in lots of different delivery sectors, mm-hmm. everything from grocery delivery to food delivery to auto parts delivery. We can talk about that. Uh, but I'm really happy to say that we've been finding jobs for drivers all over the country. We've uh, promoted a few people on our team internally and even have been hiring a few uh, additional people. So good news on all that front, but it's a lot to juggle. Right so now. I've been calling you the Walmart grocery delivery guy and you won their prestigious um, partner of the year award last year. Can you talk about that? What, what's it like working with Walmart? Um, It's great, actually. Um, You know, Walmart, while a giant company, uh, essentially runs each of their divisions with a lot of autonomy. So we really work with a pretty tight grocery delivery team on their side. Uh, But it's exciting. It's uh, fast paced. It's go, go, go. Um, We're doing a great job uh, with my team and technology platform to keep up and keep driving the conversation. So it's it's exciting. Um, It's a lot of scaling up. If you're a and you name other part, other companies you deliver for, you guys deliver for. Yeah. So what we do is there's a we support the delivery infrastructure. So there's a lot of small to medium regional courier companies, distribution companies, things we might not even know um, that support everything behind the scenes. So the products being delivered are very recognizable from, you know, uh, national auto parts delivery companies to grocery delivery companies, um, some large restaurant food companies, things like that. But so at the end of the day, a lot of times our clients, and this is where, you know, scrappy entrepreneurs these days in the delivery space with all the COVID-19 stuff going on, uh, they're delivering anything for everybody. They're leveraging their networks, they're adding more driver jobs. So if you're looking for work, this is a space in the world you can go. And so I've got clients delivering, you know, puzzles and boxes from Target to, you know, food and groceries from the local markets and the same. Mm-hmm. That's really cool. And when this whole coronavirus thing started to shut down the economy, you had a phone call or a conversation with Walmart, right? They're, they're, yeah. up, they're wanting to up level their delivery service or something. Can you talk about that and, and what the government has in store? Yeah, I mean, we had a conversation with some of the senior team over there, uh, you know, a week before the big announcements came from, as we may recall, from Amazon on one hand. Uh, they said they wanted to hire 100,000 warehouse workers and delivery personnel to then a couple of days later, Walmart wants to add a, and has been adding 150,000 jobs all across the country. And that means a lot. Of different things so uh delivery is a big big been a big big part of that so we have not slowed down the expansion of the grocery delivery infrastructure at all In fact, that's, actually, to go- that's actually one of the purposes of uh why i wanted to do this broadcast with you was because a lot of people uh, i think they're going to find themselves out of a job once this is all over and instead of getting sad or depressed they could turn to a company like yours for a possible position right yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, always give us a call, you know, our website, not to come plug it, but it's ddiwork.com, Delivery Drivers Inc., W-O-R-K.com, ddiwork.com. And, you know, we're always happy to try to find uh, job placements either with our network of people or otherwise. But I think on a broader basis, whether I work with them or not, it's not about my company. It's about this space. It's kind of like knowing that grocery stores are very, very busy we're leaning on them hardly. There's a lot of jobs in that space. So if you're out of work and you need to consider some agility and jumping into something else, there's definitely a lot of opportunities. So this this grocery delivery service for Walmart, DoorDash, all that sort of stuff, Uber Eats, th- this is not going anywhere, right? Is this, this job is gonna be, they call it the gig economy, right? It's sticking around? A hundred percent. The gig economy, I think, refers to the 1099 nature of the workforce, of course, and the ability for the drivers, kind of like Uber and Lyft, right, to pick and choose and control our own fates. But you are a hundred percent right. The statistics show that there are shifts after pandemics. When we start to lean on certain things, there will be a shift. Can't wait for your uh, Todd English to come on and hear what's going to happen in the restaurant industry, uh, for example. But there's shifts in the delivery world. We know that the tide is essentially rising. So I wanted to share the message today. It's not just delivery jobs. I know there's a lot of fear in that and getting out right now, especially in contact. But think of everything around it. There's more marketing jobs. There's more sales jobs, more customer service jobs in here uh, in, in this world. Leadership, technology. It's really amazing some of the things that are going on. So think of the space. Think of the world. 
mm -hmm. uh, of delivery in so many senses because it's going to be different. We were already leaning on it more. I know some friends that are like, I'm not going to go to the grocery store after getting it delivered for the last three months. It's great. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. And last time I saw you, it was really cool. We were at your house and, and you're like, uh, yeah, I, I need to order food for, for, I think it was mother's day, right? Mother's day brunch. And oh, yeah, we were you went on your laptop and you ordered your groceries and the next morning it, they were right there. And I was like, what? I'd never seen that before. Yeah. That's crazy. It, it, it's fun. I mean, it, but it's, it's a way of life. You know, I think we all start to shift and to change and how we do things. It becomes lifestyle and it's not just food. I think that's the other thing we're lear learning here. Like think yeah. of the things we're leaning on from a delivery standpoint, it's pharmaceuticals. It's getting your groceries, not, I'm sorry, not just your groceries, but your, your medicines to you. Right. And there's no excuses either like let's let's say to your audience because i know your audience right there's no excuses to be ordering doordash you know jack in the box all the time because you can get healthy food delivered to your home heck i love cooking it's been my fun thing to lean on in the quarantine but anyway. yeah um so a lot of people are worried about that contact what are you telling your drivers to keep them safe it's a lot of what we know um it's so First things first, it's it's again, and I don't want to you know repeat the messages we hear all the time everywhere, but they are always washing their hands. There are a lot of tools that are being provided from sanitizer to gloves. There's non-contact uh, dis social distancing happening at the restaurant in addition to the delivery point of contact. And that's probably the biggest feature on here that's safest for both the delivery and the customers when we're on the other receiving side of things is if uh, the, the delivery product, I guess you're choosing, has the option for non-contact delivery. Uh, leave it at my door, please, things like that. Almost the entire world in my space has adjusted just like that to be able to see this technology. It's a choice when you order your pizzas, things like that. What do you think about like if you order a box from Amazon? Mm -hmm. uh, is, what are you guys telling your drivers in terms of? I mean, is there coronavirus on that box? What should the recipient do with that box? Should they wipe it down? Do you know? Well, yeah, I think you and I watch that and share a lot of the same information back and forth in some of those videos. I love the video of the doctor in Michigan. I think it was. Uh, that really shows about 10 minutes long. I'm sure you've shared it on your channel. If you haven't shared it again, Doug, um, about how to handle and intake our groceries. And I think we need to handle and intake everything from a sanitization standpoint, whether it's groceries or, you know, uh, I get the, <laughs> I'm old. I get the Wall Street Journal still, the newspaper delivered to my house. And I think about it and I'm like, okay, take it out of the bag, slide it out, throw the bag away, wash your hands. You know, all of these contact issues, especially right now, we have to your message when you open the show, we have to continue to be diligent for, I believe, personally, my opinion, at least another month or two. OK. And what's um, so so let's shift gears a little bit about the 1099. Can you explain what the, the topic is there, the argument, the discussion that happened there in the legislature? Because you were a big part of getting that legislature passed or discussed in California. Yeah, there's a few things. I mean, two sides of the conversation. Um, what I think you're referring to in California is a, a pretty uh, popular or you know prominent bill called AB5, which really talks about independent contractor status, whether it is an allowable thing, what adjustments need to be made in the future. Um, really what that comes down to at a high level for your show today, I think, what I would say is that the this is the government understanding that 1099 gig economy workers are here. It is a thing, it is a significant portion of our workforce and they're trying to do what the government does, support mm -hmm. it, codify it, put some legislature and laws around it, similar to, from a historical perspective, child labor laws. Mm -hmm. 100 years ago we said, oh look, kids work, we should create some rules and safety and structure. It's a similar thing to that side. So there's an acceptance and an understanding, and there's a little bit of fights coming through from a government sort of uh, political standpoint on what is or is not an independent contractor. So we're on the front lines of that, working in the 1099 world with drivers. That's cool. So if somebody, I mean, I've been encouraging my following 
to not sit around on the sidelines, not wait to see what happens with my job. I've actually been telling my following, like they need to post their stuff and sell it on Facebook marketplace and, you know, get a bunch of cash and that sort of stuff and apply for the benefits and the, and, uh, that the stimulus bill was doing. Right. Mm -hmm. So if somebody said, okay, I'm just sitting around all day long, maybe I'll see what this grocery delivery or gig economy is like, how would they get started? What would they do? Well, look to your local market. Your local city and not your local market. Like, well, I mean, could look to the local market, but look to your local town. Support your local businesses first. Support your community. If you're in Houston or if you're in Laguna Beach like us, you know, Doc and I here, then look to the local community. What services and companies do we rely on right now? If you want to look at the delivery space, you can go everything from going to your favorite restaurants. If you want to work with those restaurants directly, a lot of restaurants have had to shift to creating delivery jobs, you know, because they don't have waiter jobs and things like that mm -hmm. uh, to some of the larger services, uh, as you know, from Amazon and DoorDash and Grubhub. There's lots and lots of things available as far as that goes. Uh, so well, I, I, think could, I, could, I could go to your website, right? DDIWorks.com. Yeah, you can go to our website. It's a, again, it's Delivery Drivers Inc. or DDIWork.com. D D I W O R dot com. And then what is it? They just apply for a job or they put in their city they live in? Or yeah, what? you just go right on there. It's essentially look to find a driver job on there and you'll filter through with your zip code and see what's in the area. But don't give up. Even if things are active, they're not active. Things are always shifting in our world. Uh, so even if there's not something there, uh, somebody from one of our last broadcasts actually that we did had contacted me after I think we did. Uh, the last stream together and said, oh, there isn't anything in Albuquerque live today. I see Las Cruces active. And so I was able to point her in the direction of something else uh, that just wasn't on the front side. So, so, so realistically, how much money could a driver make if they say they drove six hours a day? It's going to depend on what you're doing, not to give you a political answer, but usually you're going to be at the top line right around this $20, $25 an hour range. It's pretty much a, the the, well, and that's on the front side now in a 1099 world, you know, so if you're making a hundred, 150 bucks, think of it like being a waiter or a waitress where you get gratuities that are going to be factored into that. You're going to get all, all of your different fair dynamics again, depending on are you delivering groceries or people or products, whatever. Um, yeah. Sometimes you're delivering products, you might be able to deliver a lot of boxes, but just at a lower fare, things like that. Um, yeah. So these apps like shipped or whatever, like the uh, customer can leave you a tip, right? Absolutely. In fact, that's one of the things that we do in my company is literally processing the tips, the delivery fees, everything for the worker. The point I was getting at, Duck, is that, yeah, you should be able to make 20, 25 bucks an hour, but you're going to have to pay for your own gasoline and certain expenses like that being a 1099 worker. So, you know, make sure you're you're prepared to understand how all that works. Yeah, but it would be a good uh, good way to supplement, at least supplement some income. It's the perfect idea for that. Again, I think the best analogy most people understand is that the life of an Uber or a Lyft driver, right? Mm -hmm. You've got your daytime gig and you can essentially say, oh, gee, what do I want to do? Um, you know, don't want to work today, tonight, all day tomorrow. Not at all. It's up to me. So in that context, it's hard to put an hourly number on a per hour conversation. But if you're working, mm -hmm. you know more or less full time, you should be able to clear $100, $150 a day. You know, good days in the grocery delivery world, since we're talking about Walmart, sometimes it's over $200 if the drivers are really banging out orders. Um, but the message to the to the audience, we've got 1,300 people on here, is be nice to your delivery people. Tip them well. Tip them a little extra because they're out there. Well, put themselves They are. No. They are. And the other, the other point I'd like to get across, and I know we touched on it, but these jobs aren't going away in the future, right? I mean, this is going to be part of our economy, this delivery service, right? It, it already has been. I mean, you know me. I mean, I've worked in this world for a long time, and I can tell you definitively the delivery and logistics space, look for jobs and logistics out there, uh -huh. um, it's been growing and growing and growing. And I'll repeat the point I said earlier if the audience didn't hear it. It's not just delivery driver jobs. Of course, there are delivery driver jobs. But it is everything around it. There around are technology it. jobs. There's dispatching jobs, management, leadership, sales, marketing. So much around this world is growing. It's excellent. That's really awesome. So in terms of uh, when the – I'm going to ask you to put on your scope. 
when when whenever we go back to normalcy, when when this ban is lifted and we go back, how do you see what are the major changes you're you're predicting for the economy? Well, I hope that one of the best changes that we see from my world of 1099 independent contractor, independent workforces, you know, the, the solopreneur. What I really hope is to see some of the action we've seen the government take, some of the interesting programs, specifically the independent contractors access to SBA programs, the independent contractors access to unemployment insurance, things that the, traditionally the 1099 world wasn't there. I am excited to see the, the fight <laughs> and the evolution and candidly what sticks in this space, uh, you know, because, well, not to be too preachy, but to be able to see unemployment access and some support for the 1099 world. And again, now, what did we say before this morning, Doug? Not just drivers, artists, musicians, you know, graphic designers, bookkeepers, all the 1099 independent workers of the world in all industries. I hope to see some change that comes from some of this in the uh, benefits space, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's really cool. Um, what do you think is going to happen if another pandemic happens? Do you think we're going to react the same way? Do you think we're going to react sooner? Do you think we're going to next time not shut down the economy and see how many people die? Or <laughs> Should have had a Bloody Mary before our interview today if we were going to go this route with it. Yeah have this conversation you know i i would hope that we learn <laughs> and that we prepare better um so in in that sense from a a pure viral health standpoint you, you say pandemic so if we're on very specifically a health crisis yes i hope that our health system our healthcare system and workers in the interim in between now and then get the respect the raises the money the support and then what does that mean? You know, back stocking masks and respirators or whatever PPE is needed in this world. You're a doctor, you're a surgeon, your career, you know better than I what I'm talking about here, but that, that's what my thoughts are there. You know, I think it's interesting when, when they uh, announced, um, you know, closure of elective surgeries, things like that, mm -hmm. like there's gonna be a major shift in how healthcare is delivered. And I've been pleasantly surprised. A lot of my surgeon friends and their programs have gone to online um, appointments. So they'll, they started Zooming. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than being able to, to see the weight of the patient or whatever, like they've been able to keep their follow-up and, and appointments and stuff going. And, um, you know, a lot of the surgeons are like, why haven't I done this sooner? <laughs> well, I think we're going to see that in the future of medicine where you're going to have virtual visits much more common than in, in pay, like in person visits. Well, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, there's a product we're looking uh, to institute right now is a new 1099 telehealth program mm. in our world. Um, and then you and I, I believe have a mutual entrepreneur friend that's in the same uh, telehealth uh, video space. It's, mm. it's amazing. And I, I'm, I'm so excited. The nerd in me is really excited to see the next applications of technology. You know, can I get like a little, you know, finger pulse bio scanner that I can yeah. connect a USB to my laptop and it's going to give you a good amount of my readings, you know, and prick my finger and give you a blood sample right there. Mm. I hope so that's really cool because then there you go. Yeah. You know, cheating and eating too many sugars on my diet. <laughs> <laughs> So what's um, a few a couple of years ago they were talking about drones delivering mm -hmm. stuff. Where are we with that? Uh, there, there's early applications of it that have been pretty cool. Uh, we've actually seen it in the medical space where drone delivery was authorized early on was not to the mass market. It was uh, for uh, rescue, support, uh, emergency aid delivery, and to those vehicles, it's been pretty productive. I don't know how good it's going to be getting you a hot pizza to your door. We'll see. <laughs> we'll get there. Um, how long until I get my pizza delivered by drone? Well, there is in certain high uh, population density areas right now, there is robotic delivery. There yeah. absolutely is. Yeah. So I can share some videos for you later and you can put them up there. But where, you know, it, essentially there's a robotic car. Think of a pizza delivery. The pizzas are loaded into the car. The car self-drives, all a Tesla style. 
And when it pulls up, you, the customer, now have to go to the curb, to the car, because there's no human there. But the video I can send you shows the back window rolling down, the pizza coming up. So it's is like, that testing? They're testing that, or is that rolled out? No, already? those things are live out there. There's definitely yeah. some happening. Uh, you know, little beta programs I've seen in like Pittsburgh and this and that, and certain cities that are just running test programs of it. But they're working on the technology. We'll see. We'll see. It depends on the product. I really, at the end of the day, it really comes down to the product. Yeah. So are you worried about um, self self driving cars destroying your business? <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, just I again, I just think of everything I think of as an evolution. Right, it's just jobs shift and change into other jobs and differing sort of levels of support there. So no, and at the end of the day, um, I think we will see an uh, evolution, as I've said a lot today, but uh, I'll do a different word. I think we're gonna see an addition, that's the word I would ask, uh, of robots and robotic delivery and drone delivery. And, and think of it this way, if the needs are here and the human workforce is already challenging to keep up with our needs. And suddenly we're saying the demand is rising. We're going to need yeah, like this to help to continue to bridge the gap. Does it mean that all those millions of people that are employed in the logistics sector aren't going to have a space? I don't believe so. Right. So that's, that's really cool. So um, where, where do you, where do you see, the future of all this going? Is it going to be completely, I mean, are we going to ever have social contact again? Are we ever going to, you know, oh, is it all going to go fully automated? No. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, well, we'll get to see each other again. I promise. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, you know, we'll get through this is, is my short answer here. I think we're going to see some social changes. I think we'll see some cultural changes, things like that. What are those going to be? I don't know. Yeah. You know, um, honestly, uh, you know, uh, I, I've traveled a lot and I love to go to like Asia. I know you're from Vietnam. And when you think, kind of think of cultures there, you know, shaking hands as just an example and that culture and all of Asians, are, it's not a thing. You don't do it. You know, it's like, Hey, how are you? <laughs> what business cards are for? So I don't have to touch you. You know, that's part of that exchange in the business world. And to that end, Will we see the uh, dissolution of the of the handshake in you know in the United States? Maybe that might be you know it might be like maybe we do air fives from now on. That's our thing. I don't know. So so as the owner, of the company, I'm going to answer that on every interview I do from now on. What's next? Air fives from like air five. <laughs> we make the noise too. <laughs> <laughs> So as the owner of a company that handles 10,000 to 12,000 drivers, you're pretty big in the business world. And you're also very active in your entrepreneurial business organizations there in California. Where do you see this economy heading? Are you, do you think we're headed for a recession? Do you think we're going to rebound? Do you think it's going to go into a depression? They're talking 30% unemployment now. I think it's going to be tough. I mean, if we're going to have some real talk, I think at a macro level, things are not going to be easy. Um, I think we see the ripple effects of you know, the economy here. You know, everybody's excited uh, to be able to defer their rent for two months, but I actually thought about the cash flow impact of what that means of, you know, all those companies that employ all those people that, you know, how, do, how does that ripple effect go? So I am worried. Um, I think we need to be responsible. And I think the message here I would offer is one you've been great with, by the way, and keep it up, Doug of consistency of be fiscally responsible don't overspend you know cut some of those expenses do what you can yeah. to be conservative right now because i think i hope for the best but i think we need to be prepared for the uh you know kind of near future to be tough oh, maybe yeah. that's 18 months might not be the easiest i, know. I agree we're headed for like some hard times we have i want to take some viewer comments or questions of the last time yeah, I can't uh, see them, so you got to read them. I'm only on the oh, video. Hey, you can see it. Check this out. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Well, uh, guys, what about concerts and sporting events? After vaccine, it'll be okay. Wait one and a half, two years. No concert for two years. I'm a, I'm a cry. Right. So uh, Aaron also um, used to own or still owns a um, minor league, minor league soccer. soccer team in Albuquerque called the Del, Del Sol. Just Sol. Yeah, the Sol. Yeah. And um, so what, what do you think about sporting events? 
Man, this has been an interesting conversation I've had uh, with a couple of different people from our friends at events.com, uh, what they've talked about behind the scenes and what's going on in the event space uh, to the sports world. Man, I'm a little worried, but it's such a huge part of our global culture. It will be back, but I do believe it'll be on the latter part of our back to normal. It's mm -hmm. going to a baseball game, a hockey game. It's not going to be the first thing that we're allowed to do. That'd be mm -hmm. my turn. What do you think, Doug? Well, I, from a medical standpoint, we have to figure out really who is vulnerable. So this antibody test is going to tell us who was previously infected with coronavirus and now who has an immune response so that they'll be able to fight it off. And once we have an antibody test and it's deployed to the population, then um, that will give us a standard by which we can then go back to work and start opening up the, the country. And you're gonna either going to have to have, um, I, you know, a surgeon friend said this the other day, like apparently in South Korea, the government got together and they created an app. And this app, once you got tested, you were, you were negative or positive, right? So you, you had this app that said that you were negative, for example, and that allowed you your pass to go around. Oh, that's and, a way better solution than everybody getting a tattoo that says, good. Yeah, that's not so good. Yeah. If you're positive, then um, that app would make you stay at home in quarantine. And if you left your quarantine, you would get automatically fined but it's only on that app. If, if a virus like this becomes a permanent or semi-permanent semi -permanent dynamic in our life, mm -hmm. I think you're right. You'll see certifications. You'll see health certifications. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a masseuse, you know, you'll have to get tested every six months and get your, your questions. So. so Mary Scott wants to know, major question, do we wear masks or not? What are you telling your drivers? Uh, short answer, yes. Mm -hmm. they heed caution. Um, it's not going to hurt anything. Um, so I'll lean to the doctor. Wait, to the, uh, to the doctor on this one. But uh, my two cents in, in the delivery world, the short answer is mask and gloves if you can. Mask and gloves if you're a delivery driver. Yeah. And, you know, I had a neighbor. I was at, outside gardening. And, uh, wow, we have 1,500 people on the live right now. We, um, there were, uh, my neighbor outside uh, had something delivered and the deliver the the guy was coming up with her package and she shouts out from her door like leave it there <laughs> and he acts, he's like what <laughs> he drops it he goes okay okay he puts it like halfway down her driveway and I just, hear somebody, you've been to my house i have this balcony here that overlooks the front and a driver couldn't find something the other day and i was like up here and they were like ah <laughs> yeah all right any other questions oh my gosh 1500 people we get two questions yeah, I know. Charlene LG. So does it look like it will go dormant or is it just going to linger? No, we're going to have uh, coronavirus with us. I'm going to guess it's going to stay with us. Uh, and it's just going to be like the flu where it's just um, we're just going to have to deal with it. And our hopes are that um, that it doesn't mutate. It should be a pretty stable virus. Oh, here we go. Here's a good question. Kim Lucas, what are the precautions for the drivers when they're picking up food for groceries? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> the drivers have been a little complaining about grocery delivery specifically uh, because they have a non-contact protocol that's been instituted at that level too, which everybody should be happy to know. Mm -hmm. Meaning a driver arrives, they have to stay in their car, windows rolled up, and it's usually placed with social distancing protocols in the back from the grocery standpoint. So there's no contact between the delivery personnel and the in this case, grocery store, but a lot of restaurants are doing comparable rules. So there's a lot of procedures on that side. Sort of slows things down, so be patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the grocery stores are, um, you know, the last time I went, they were doing really good. They had lots of dedicated people wiping down the carts. Mm -hmm. Everybody's all gloved. They put up those clear glass barriers when you're checking out. Yeah, they, did that too. they have that, right? But I do have an issue with um, the credit card machine they don't wipe down the credit card machines and i'm sitting there having to hit enter my button and time and stuff it's so funny so here's my advice i what switched to credit that? no more debit i switched to credit and i thought yeah. this actually you, because i could go whoop, and then yeah, you you right out. Sign for it and stuff what's that 
you know, you still have to sign for it and stuff. They waived all of those signature requirements, um, even in the delivery space uh, in California, at least. So here we do not. So I can just put my card in with two fingers, pull it right out, and it's my card, and that was it. And yeah. <laughs> hopefully Texas does that too for you guys. Chad wants to know, when is the best time to go buy food at the store? Right when it opens or right before it closes to avoid people? I don't know. What do you do, Doug? Uh, I don't go that often. Um, so if there's, if there's a line, if I have to wait, I usually just keep, I go to my next door. Luckily I live, uh, within walking distance, like literally a block away from a grocery store. That's not, that's not busy at all for whatever reason. It's not busy at all. Usually there might be at the most like, like six or seven other people in the store at the same time with me. So I haven't had that big of an issue. So I'd say two things, Chad, Chad. Uh, rope to your question. One, uh, I'm with Duck. Try to go for and shop for two, three weeks at a time mm -hmm. so you can go less often. And number two, in California here, we have a lot of um, senior hours that have been adopted for the first hour of the stores, whether you know, 7 to 8 a.m. or 8 to 9 a.m., whatever the first hour is. So maybe right after that is maybe not a terrible time to go uh, as well. Uh, Sherry Cheery, they keep talking about a vaccine, but they have never come up with common cold. I'm correct. Well, coronavirus causes symptoms very similar to a cold. So, uh, there's just lots of different influenzas. Here's our girl, Shelly Grunig. How do, Hi, how do you entrepreneurs best figure out how to pivot? This is a good question. Maybe we'll end on this one. Wow. Well, uh, Shelly, I know Shelly, so she's probably going to know part of my answer on this one. So, uh, but for the other 1500 people on here, I would say find your peers. Mm. I, I believe in learning from others, uh, learn from others, successes, learn from others, failures, find your local business groups for your industry, for your world, for men, for women, for your ethnicity, for your industry, whatever. But find your peers. It's how Duck and I met each other it's through a business mastermind. Yeah. That's why we became friends. And it's in that group that I can see what my friends are doing in different worlds, what they're doing well in the real estate industry and things like that. So it's sort of a global answer for you, Shelly. But pivoting is about knowledge. It's about learning. It's about having good ideas and crazy ideas of where you can go. But don't uh, – last thing I would say is be brave. You know, right now, and that I think applies to everybody, but take those chances right now. Jump off that cliff, build the airplane on the way down, I think is the analogy for a lot of entrepreneurs. And just be brave. Don't be afraid to take a shot, especially today. Yeah, usually if you do the opposite of what the masses are doing, you, you're going to do pre, be pretty successful. So while people are in fear mode right now, it'd be a good time to reevaluate your business and see how you could take advantage of the situation by helping others through this time period. So on a personal note, like when I started looking at coronavirus, this was probably March 12th because March 11th, the World Health Organization declared it a pandemic. And I was like, what? And so I started reading up on it and I was like, oh man, this is not good. And so there are a lot of people who weren't taking it seriously back then. And so I just committed to doing a Facebook Live a day and yelling at people. <laughs> And it just caught on fire. So now we've got 1,600 people on the live feed listen to Captain America here, Aaron Hagman, talk about the future of drivers and the gig economy and, and just dropping massive knowledge on us. And so I'd just like to take this time, Aaron, to thank you for everything you do, for providing all these jobs. You got 12,000 drivers that you deal with. Um, you're, you know, preferred partner with uh, major companies like Walmart and you make things like grocery delivery possible to keep us all safe and, and you earn every great award and reward that's coming your way, brother. I'm so happy to call you a friend. I love you, my friend, and keep your family safe and to everybody else on the broadcast today. Thanks for joining and, uh, feel free to connect with me, find me on LinkedIn or wherever out there and, uh, you know, happy Easter, everybody. And if they wanted to apply one more time for your a job or look if see what's available, sure. My website is a starting point, um, especially in the driver world, which is uh, the company's called Delivery Drivers Incorporated, and the website is ddiwork.com. Ddiwork.com. Awesome. I'm going to kick you out of here and then take some coronavirus questions for these people. Cool. Absolutely. We'll talk Love later. You. Bye. Love you. Bye. Hey, everybody. See ya.
How cool is my buddy Aaron Hagman, man? Isn't he amazing? Can you believe that you now know, you've been introduced to, you've heard the man responsible for grocery, Walmart grocery delivery service. That's him. You just saw him. He's an amazingly nice, generous, kind guy. You would not even know it um, if you'd met him. If you saw him walking down the street, he's not pompous. He's not arrogant. He's super generous with his time and everything he does. And, um, you know, that's what the world really needs more of. So for you who are still watching, I just want you to know, I really appreciate y'all. I really appreciate your support. Someone made the comment that I need to get people an assistant to help me with these questions, which is true. But real quick, I'm gonna take some of your questions. Uh, but before that, I wanna reset, remind everybody that because of how serious we took the social isolation, and I know there's still some people who deny it, but we've been able to blunt the curve and we've kept the number of deaths down. We're gonna, you know, 20, 21,000 today, deaths in the United States today. And they're still projecting about 60,000 deaths, which at a 4% uh, death rate, we're still gonna have two and a half million cases of coronavirus in the United States alone. But um, because we are now isolated, we're at home, we're quarantined, we're shut down. I've uh, decided to transition my uh, platform to more of an edutainment uh, platform, which is education and entertainment. So I'm gonna educate you about coronaviruses, your health, what to do to stay healthy, but we're gonna do it in an entertaining way with special guests like um, what you just saw with Aaron Hagman. In the future broadcast, we've got uh, Walter O'Brien coming, who's currently the world's smartest man that the TV show Scorpion is based on. Um, that's the story of his life. He's gonna talk about, is this really a government conspiracy? What businesses are doing to prepare for when you turn back on? He's coming on next week. I've got Todd English, chef, chef, celebrity chef Todd English. If you remember him, he's amazing. He's going to talk, come on and talk about what's happening with restaurant workers and the restaurant industry. I've got uh, celebrities such as uh, Jill, Jill, uh, Jillian uh, Maline, who's um, play was on Mad TV. She did the Britney Spears impersonations. Uh, she's going to be amazing. I have Potsy. Anson Williams Potsy from Happy Days coming and hopefully he will bring Don Most who played Ralph Mouth. Who remembers Ralph Mouth? So uh, we're gonna talk about how this has affected the acting industry. But you guys gotta remember like they've shut down movies, TV productions, everything. So all of the people who um, worked behind the scenes, editing, camera, you know, gaff boys, lighting, they're all out of work right now. So they're suffering. So um, I want to have these people to come on and talk about how coronavirus has affected the industry, how they're going to um, rebound from it, and what we can do to support them. I also have Roddy Chong, who's the uh, electronic violinist from the Trans-Siberian Orchestra coming to talk. He also was the violinist for Shania Twain and a little lady you might have heard, it, heard of named Celine Dion. So he was on tour with them. So. Um, he's got a, a lot of really cool stories to talk about uh, and uh, what's happening in the music industry. So these are all things that you guys can look forward to uh, while you're sitting at home um, dealing with this coronavirus issue. So uh, let me take some questions here. Hey. Wow, it's going by so fast. All right. Uh, Todd Tate, how long do you think this coronavirus is going to last? We're really, we're going to be in this uh, through May for sure. Um, for sure. Uh, although we're, we've done really good. We got to stay vigilant with the things we're doing, Todd, and don't give up now. Okay. How, Stalina, uh, how will the bars and restaurants be affected by this? We know that we're going to lose a lot of the restaurants, especially your little local restaurants are going to shut down. Um, they basically, most restaurants have about two days to seven days of cash on hand. Uh, and so they are really, really hurting. One of my best friends um, from high school has two uh, restaurants and he's an investor in a third one in Dallas and I need to reach out to him, uh, but he's shy. He's an introvert. He's probably not gonna wanna come on, but we know it's gonna be trouble. So Misty Fisher, Dr. Vaughn, question sex and COVID-19, can this virus be transferred through sexual body fluids? 
uh, through kissing. It can be for sure. Um, so, you know, it's in our oral airway. So it lives in our mouth, our tongues, our throats, and you're all up close to people. And we know it goes through droplets, right? So when you're deep breathing, hopefully you're having good sex, not shitty, crappy sex. <laughs> so you should be deep breathing and panting and sweating. You know how that goes. So that's going to be expressed out in droplets, right? Misty, you know what I'm talking about? And so you're going to get through kissing. Um, it's not sexually transmitted like what you think about with HIV. And actually HIV, how HIV is transmitted sexually is um, if blood is exchanged through anal sex. So it's, um, uh, you know, that's why it, it passed in the, um, and I'm not being ugly, right? And I, I'm not anti-gay. I love, I have lots of gay friends, it's fine. But that's how it passed in the gay community um, uh, initially and then it made its way into the heterosexual community. So, um, all right, let's see what other questions we got. Any other questions? Yes. What do you think of that New York doctor that said this is not ARDS? He's wrong. Um, you know, I think you're referring to that emergency room doctor. He put a little video. He's compared it to altitude sickness, um, which isn't which isn't correct. Um, it is, it, and I've done videos about this where it's it's ARDS, but it's manifesting in different ways also. And this has this is the uniqueness of the coronavirus. And it's too early to tell. So here's the medicine side, guys, for you who want to know the medicine side, is that um, it's um, it has different features. It causes ARDS and then it's doing other weird things. So there seems to be clots, blood clots. Those are called emboli microvascular emboli in the arteries of the lungs that looks somewhat unusual not quite like AR ARDS um, and the rate at which probably explains how these patients are crashing pretty quickly um, which is unlike other respiratory illnesses usually you can linger for a while patients with coronavirus once they get into the respiratory distress mode they're crashing a lot faster so there's something unusual about that. Also, we seem to think that the coronavirus, for whatever reason, whatever mechanism, is attacking other tissues. So it's attacking uh, like heart tissues, for example. Way much more technical, too, too, um, too much conjecture right now for us to really say. Oh, which I want, someone asked me about um, quite the, uh, hydroxychloroquine please <laughs> actually okay hold on here's uh, some regions of spain uh oh i lost it i want to talk about spain okay here we go how can you explain that some regions of spain for example um the total number of deaths per day increased four times so i've had this conversation with my international colleagues all right like why Look at the countries, right? Italy, Spain, France have had a terrible um, outbreak uh, in terms of not just the numbers, but also um, like the deaths. So you have to think, and, and the way my, my European friends explained it, which made a lot of sense was this, you have to look and see um, those cultures. And as a culture, Italians, Man, if they like you, they'll kiss you mwah, mwah, cheek to cheek. And if they really like you, they put they put one right on your lips. So that culture, French, Italian, Spanish culture, there's a lot of close up face to face action happening. So that was a big, big reason why it really spread so quickly in those areas, we think. Um, England is very similar, pretty densely populated, tight. They also might have been a little bit slower to take action on social social isolation. So England's hurting. Um, yeah, uh, New York City. So Aaron and I talked about this, like New York City versus California, right? So California shut down uh, on a Monday. New York City waited two or three more days before they, they shut down. And then you think about the commuter system of New York City with the you know, train system, the subway, the buses, the taxis, the congested people all living very close together. You have apartment buildings where a thousand people will live in an apartment building. 
holding open the doors, mailboxes, keys, you know, counter spaces, handrails. So it was very easy to see how it could really um, take off in New York City. Good question. Okay, here we go. Uh, quinine doesn't work. I've heard the same thing in interleukin-6 inhibitors. Jillian Duncan. Yo, what a profile pick. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm glad you're happy. I'm, I'm glad you're happy, Jillian. So that I posted that yesterday uh, about how the CDC has taken down um, and countered Trump's in, you know, early enthusiasm about um, hydroxychloroquine. And I've been saying that there's no data that shows that hydroxychloroquine and, um, and an antibiotic such as um, uh, the z pack azithromycin shows a benefit. So not through studies. So you have anecdotal stories where people, a small number of people um, are given the combination and they might get better. The problem with that is it's too small of a number. It's underpowered. You're not going to be able to show any significant difference versus not treating them at all. By that, I mean, there's going to be a percentage of people who would have gotten better anyway if you hadn't given them the treatment. So then what happens? So you have a story that says something along the lines of this doctor was starting to feel sick. So he gave himself um, hydroxychloroquine and he got better after five days. Well, we already know most people, 80% of people are going to recover from this anyway, right? So when you, so there, there's a good chance he would have recovered anyway. Um, and we just don't know those numbers. My point is, if you want to take it, if you're scared, if your doctor tells you to take it, take it. If your doctor says, hey, yeah, it might help, take it. You're absolutely right. Should we hoard it? No, because hydroxychloroquine is used for other things like lupus. And those patients need it so that they can walk around and their, their joints don't hurt. Does that make sense? We know that's proven to work for those conditions. Hydroxychloroquine has not been shown to be effective against coronavirus. And that's why the CDC uh, took it off their website as a recommendation. I don't care what the anecdotal stories are. I, I, yes, I know people recover. They might have recovered anyway. Scientifically speaking, medical literature wise, there is no efficacy. We don't know. There are not good studies. Dr. Vaughn, what about that French paper that came out? You mean that shitty, really poorly conducted um, French study with a thousand people that is so poorly designed that it has so many type two errors that it's just impossible. Like it's embarrassing. And we're allowing it to spread one, because we have social media, two, it's sensational, it gives you hope, and three, it boosts somebody's ego about it. So what I think we're going to find out is that hydroxychloroquine and azithromax will not help once you start having symptoms of coronavirus. I just don't see how it works because if you understand the mechanism of these medicines, you should have, um, in order for it to really help against any viral replication, you should have taken it prophylactically. Now, are we going to start just giving people who haven't been tested, prophylactic, hydroxychloroquine. No, that's not how we act. That's not what medicine is intended for. Does that make sense what I'm saying? We don't react out of fear. We don't just, because there's a downside. There are major side effects with these medicines, um, like heart conditions. It's called QT prolongation. It slows down your heartbeat. Um, one segment of your heartbeat called your QT interval. And, um, and, we, and we think that, if it, that the coronavirus affects heart tissue, and now you're giving it a medicine that has a complication with the heart in a patient who's gravely ill and, a, and in a situation that's dire, it's just not a good setup for success. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Overall, 
and when you when you and you might we might not even have a dosage right we're just randomly giving people hydroxychloroquine and and um antibiotic and we might be totally off on the dose we might be too high or too low like we know the dose of hydroxychloroquine and lupus we know what that should be we know that F, we studied that we know the level you want to be in the, i'll give you an example somebody who goes to see the doctor with a runny nose and they and a, and a thick cough and and they're they want to have antibiotics and the doctor says well most likely this is viral and an antibiotic won't help you but the patient will get upset and said but listen their comeback is always but i have green mucus <laughs> i blow my nose and it's green like so what where did you hear that green mucus somehow equals an antibiotic it's bizarre but anyway so the doctor will give it antibiotics and then we end up having antibiotic resistance to try to treat something that was mostly viral which wouldn't treat it anyway and then patients sit there and go, but just get, just give me the medicine anyway, just in case. But we don't know what the proper dosage is. So the antibiotic argument, what the example I was I was giving you is even if you took the antibiotic, if you never got the dosing level high enough, then you won't kill off the bacteria. You won't kill off the virus. You won't kill off whatever it is that's intended. And if there's a pharmacology person or a pharmacist who's watching right now, comment, because this is pharmacokinetics. It has to get into the bloodstream and has to reach a certain level, and then it will drop down. This is called the half-life of the medicine. Then you have to redose it, it has to go back up. And so it has to hit a high enough level that it produces a killing effect. Um, and we just don't know what that is, okay? Um, and chances are, if you're in the ICU and you're very critical, you're already on the ventilator, Dr. Vong, if they're gonna die anyway, why not give it to them? Well, you have an argument for that, but it confounds the data and you could do it, I guess. I don't know, that's between the, um, the medical practitioner who's taking care of that patient and that patient and what we're doing to handle that. All right, I've been going for over an hour. Um, I appreciate everybody who's watching and there we've had almost 1800 people live watching. So I'm do I'm using this new format StreamYard, and I'm broadcasted to my Facebook fan page as well as my uh, YouTube channel. So hopefully this is going to reach a larger audience. I hope this has been helpful. I'll edit it down. I'll edit down your questions. I'll put it up uh, on my YouTube channel for you guys to share. I appreciate all the sharing. And just remember again, we're gonna change this format to edutainment. So we're gonna educate you on not just coronavirus, but also your health, obesity, weight. But we're gonna do it in an entertaining way with special celebrity guest stars like Chef Todd English is coming on with me, Potsy from Happy Days, and I'm gonna have him hopefully drag on Ralph the Mouth, Don Most on. You, I mean, I grew up watching Happy Days, so I'm super excited uh, to interview them. Uh, Walter O'Brien, Sharon Lecter from Rich Dad Poor Dad series uh, has agreed to come on. Uh, I'm not name dropping, I'm just telling you who's coming. Um, uh, Roddy Chong from uh, Celine Dion's group as well as Shania Twain's group is gonna come on. Um, so a lot of cool people. Uh, I have a Mickey Mouseketeer, Del Godboldo, who's gonna come on. He was a Mickey Mouseketeer with Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears and so Christina Aguilar, Kerry Russell, and Ryan Gosling was a Mouseketeer, and people forget that. And uh, you can go look them up, and he's a little black kid, <laughs> Del Godboldo. We laugh about him. He was just on People vs. O.J. Simpson that won a bunch of Emmys. He was on the first Thor movie, so he's still really active still in uh, Hollywood. So I'd love to hear his input on how this is hurting or changing the movie industry, television movie industry. Um, anyway, I appreciate y'all. I love y'all. Uh, stay safe out there. Happy Easter. Um, and if you've enjoyed this, please hit subscribe and please hit share. If you didn't like this, I don't care. Go away. I'm not talking to you. I just want to talk to my fans and people who subscribed. And um, thank you for subscribing. And um, uh, please stay stay safe 
and blessings to you on this Easter Sunday. All right, guys. Love you guys. See you next time. Bye.